Let's talk about tonight's speaker. For so long, the satellite, the moon, has been a source of curiosity throughout the history of our species. Its cyclic appearance in our sky has brightened our nights, imprinted a biorhythm onto our minds, created the tidal forces which drive our oceans, and was an inspiration that led to the first landings of humans on the moon during the Apollo missions of the 1960s. The guest speaker this evening is an amateur astronomer who has had an interest in planetary geology with a particular focus on the moon and an emphasis in the areas of geologic history and photogeologic interpretation. He began his exploration of astronomy 30 years ago when he purchased his first telescope, an 8-inch Newtonian. After a brief stint in observing deep sky objects, he found a greater interest in observing the local planets and the Earth's moon. He found a variety of lunar surface objects fascinating, and so he began learning lunar geology in order to understand what he was observing. A former president of the American Lunar Society and co-author of the book Video Astronomy, please welcome Eric Douglas. Okay, greetings. <coughs> what we'll be discussing tonight are kind of the bizarre and the odd craters on the moon, the things that are really kind of of interest. Uh, it's uh, kind of fun to sit around and look at a normal crater and see its various parts and think about its uh, relative dating and how it relates to the various features around it. Uh, and that's another whole talk. And it's a wonderful one. And it's full of just things that are fascinating. But tonight we're going to be looking at the unusual craters, kind of the weird and the bizarre things on the moon, all of which you can see. I'm not presenting anything tonight that cannot be seen in a good three inch refractor or anything above it. So we'll be looking and we'll be doing something very practical, uh, but we'll be spending just a few minutes on theory, at least initially, because the first thing we have to do is look at very briefly impact mechanics so we understand what it is we're looking at. Uh, this is our outline today, impact mechanics, then some of these unusual uh, craters, which will emphasize oblique impact, simultaneous, dark haloed craters, concentric ring craters, square craters, and floor fracture craters. And then I put in a kind of a random slide from Mars with a variety of the unusual craters that it has. So let's start with the impact mechanics then. First, a few terms. Uh, the parts of a crater are the central peak, the floor, the terracing and the side walls, the rim, the continuous ejecta, the discontinuous ejecta, you can see how it begins to interfinger out into the lunar surface, which is a magma surface around it, the secondary cratering pattern, and then much further out are the bright ejecta pattern, or the bright ray pattern. <coughs> as far as how a crater is formed, it's generally divided into three stages. First is contact and compression. For a meteorite or a voloid, technical name for it, strikes the moon, it does so with very high energy. Most of these meteorites are coming into the moon at the velocity of 20 to 40 kilometers per second. Uh, since the energy is uh, proportional to the velocity squared times the mass, this creates just a vast amount of energy. Indeed, Behringer Crater, or Meteor Crater in Arizona, which is 1.1 kilometers in diameter, was thought to have released in its shock wave that was generated by the impact, uh, the same energy of rough, roughly a 15 megaton nuclear device, which is enormous. And, as most of you know, as far as craters on the moon, that would be a tiny crater. That's a small one. Uh, the transition phase into larger craters with central peaks and stuff doesn't occur until you hit 20 kilometers. And Copernicus that we were looking at earlier, that complex crater, has a diameter of 93 kilometers. Uh, so we're talking just incredible amounts of energy. Indeed, the largest crater on the moon, which is, anybody know what it is? South Star. Uh, no. The the South Pole, 18 basin. Yes, which is how long the far cross mm -hmm. diameter? 2,500 kilometers. <laughs> My God. Uh, it's enough to almost, almost fracture. Uh, the moon. <clears throat> So we're talking about energies that they, they can't even be modeled. They're so vast. That's why we don't understand these really massive impacts, which we call basins. Uh, OK, so incredible amount of velocity, a lot of uh, kinetic energy. All of that is transferred into a shock wave upon impact on the moon. And that shock wave will propagate both forward into the moon as well as rearward into the meteorite itself. The shock wave is of such high energy that it doesn't just fracture or break the meteorite, or turn it into gravel, it actually vaporizes it. Uh, it will even ionize some of it. We're talking energies that are, or pressures, that are in the order of several hundred, hundred gigapascals, 
Is there, uh, somebody have a, uh, some water? I'm so dry, I'm having trouble here. Anyway, that would be nice, thank you. Uh, several hundred gigapascals. Gigapascal is uh, 10 kilobars, kilobars a thousand atmospheres roughly. Uh, on Earth, metamorphic processes are normally in the order of uh, one to two gigapascals in order to create diamonds and things of that nature. We're talking energies that are just so much uh, out of the same range. Several hundred gigapascals. It will vaporize the rock. Uh, that vapor will both be ejected as well as injected into the surface of the moon. Uh, the next layer down, as the energy continues to dissipate according to the cube of its distance, uh, will change just to wholesale melting of the subsurface uh, rocks. Uh, the meteorite itself is almost completely vaporized. Uh, but in the surface layers, you'll have initially a, a layer that is converted into uh, vapor and then a layer which is just melted wholesale, and then you'll get partial melting inside of it with odd names like diplectic glasses. Uh, then you will get simply shock features, uh, like uh, uh, shock features are features that where there's irreversible changes, so that once the shock wave is passed, it doesn't revert to its <coughs> original form. Uh, and after that, you will finally move down into just what are called elastic changes, where there's just fra fracturing and breaking and turning to gravel and stuff of that nature. So uh, these are very energetic uh, processes. Uh, there are a few unusual processes we won't get into. I will note that spallation, though, the wonderful uh, process by which we get things like SNC meteorites from Mars, as well as some of our lunar meteorites, which are relatively unshocked. And it's due to how the shock wave interacts with the surface. Uh, so this is the contact and compression phase. Very high energy. A lot of very unusual forms are created. The next stage, once that shock wave is passed, is the excavation stage. Excavation stage is where all this material, which has been deeply compressed by the shock wave, now begins to expand out. Oh, thank you so much. It begins to expand out, and it will create the ejecta that we will see as the ejecta blank that we just talked about. It. Now, they don't have to talk about this being a refraction wave. All this stuff will get thrown out, and it will form the bright ejecta blank, the secondary cratering pattern, the discontinuous ejecta and the continuous ejecta. This will form, at the very end of the excavation phase, something called the transient crater. The transient crater <coughs> is a useful fiction that only exists for a moment at most. It is the stage where the crater is the deepest and yet not the widest. That is because the modification phase is going to immediately set in with slippage of material down the sidewalls and it's going to start filling in the crater. So the crater in simple craters will lose about a third of its depth, even up to a half of its depth. The diameter will also continue to expand because as this material slips off the sidewalls, uh, that's the, it will simply expand the, the diameter of the crater. Um, after excavation phase, all of that material is excavated, we'll have the modification phase. And that's what we've been talking about with this slippage of stuff down on the sidewalls and filling in the base in a kind of semi-consolidated layer. It's not just gravel because there's impact melt mixed in with it, which will bond the minerals and the rocks and fragments together into odd things called breccias. <coughs> Are there any geologists here? <coughs> any planetary geologists? Okay, just one. Which are you? Uh, planetary geologists. Okay. So I was wanting to avoid as much uh, our technical term. I'll throw in a few. Uh, <clears throat> uh, okay, uh, slipping. Uh, in larger craters, we, this modification phase will extend beyond just simple slipping. Other things will begin to happen as the crater size, which is dependent upon the surface gravity of the planet, uh, 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 continues to increase. On the moon, once you reach a transition phase of about 15 to 20 kilometers in diameter, we begin to get some other odd things begin to appear, like terracing in the sidewalls that we talked about, which is due to that very heavy load of material which has been thrown up on the rim. It's sitting now on deeply fractured ground from the impact, and so it will start slipping down fractures and create little terraces. I once had a person wrote me and said they thought, uh, aliens were mining the moon because of those terraces. They looked like strip mining. And he was right, they didn't look like strip mining, but it was not aliens. Uh, we'll also have a central peak often forming once you get above about 20 kilometers. 
This is due primarily to the deep compression of the bedrock structures underneath the crater, and much like a spring, that energy is going to be released and, and uplift. There's more complexity to it, but that's, that's the basic mechanism, along with uh, things like acoustic fluidization, perhaps, and um, um, subsurface materials at the shockwave beginning to act like a Bingham fluid, which deforms to uh, maybe 100 megabars. <coughs> Whoops. Okay. Uh, so that's what we that's how we get our, our complex crater and consequently here's what we see This is a nice simple crater. So probably only a few kilometers across nice rim smooth bowl-like depression The continuous ejecta merging out into discontinuous ejecta merging out into a few secondary craters Maybe over here and then we'll finally have a nice bright ejecta blanket outside. Here's one with a little higher uh, A little larger in size and higher illumination that we can see. This is our nice complex crater with the various parts that we already talked about. Nice and circular. Okay, uh, this is our ejecta pattern, the bright ejecta blanket which comes off of Crater Copernicus. It is roughly symmetrical to the rim itself and the center, roughly symmetrical and, symmetrical and it is radial to them. Uh, although there is one real oddity in here, a couple. You notice these little things? Those are dark halo craters, aren't they? Now, craters don't have dark halos around them normally, do they? They have bright ejecta, like this. So this is one of the little things we're going to come back to later on in kind of our odd craters. Okay, let's start off our, then our survey of kind of odd crater forms, which are worth searching for, and uh, I find them quite fun to find, uh, with oblique impacts. This is Copernicus, which is not an oblique impact. This is nice, symmetrical, radial ejecta pattern, and it looks like it, you know, hit the moon pretty much, you know, head on, very perpendicular. <coughs> However, here is crater, what's this, anyone? Yes, crater Pico. And we look at So, I am the fool my 15 year old says I am. <laughs> I'll give you that. Uh, here's crater Pico. Uh, and we see some real oddities here. Uh, we definitely over here have what looks like a symmetrical and a radial ejected blanket, but what are these things? Those don't go into the center. They actually appear to come out over here at the side, over close to the rim. This is an oblique impact. Uh, when oblique impacts occur, uh, we have uh, crater migration. So this is uh, from the Lunar Planetary Institute, uh, one of their conferences. This was the impact point of a meteor that was coming in at a very low angle maybe something around 30 degrees. Uh, it struck the moon, and as soon as it strikes, it begins to, it's going to begin to create some ejecta. That's going to be your uprange ejecta. And it's going to be radial to that point of impact. But the crater, the meteorite, continues to migrate as it's going down into the lunar surface. And this is going to be its kind of final resting point, if you will. And this is where the vast majority of the ejecta is going to emanate from. Consequently, in a oblique impact of under 30 degrees, and it doesn't occur much above 30 degrees, under 30 degrees, you begin to get some rays that come off not from the center, almost look like they're coming over off from the rim somewhere. Uh, this is an example, wow, I can see that slide uh, uh, kind of higher resolution, uh, of actually crater migration uh, using uh, certain kinds of codes in order to uh, map out how uh, the crater begins to shift across time, just to prove you I'm not lying. Uh, this was a really interesting study uh, where they took uh, experimental eject curtains with an impact, impact trajectory at different angles. So this is vertical, this is uh, at 45 degrees, and this is 30 degrees with respect to the normal. And then they took pictures through the ejecta, okay, so you can actually see it in real time. When it's perpendicular, you can see how the ejecta really is quite symmetrical. At 30 degrees, you're beginning, at 45 degrees, you're beginning to get some deformation and loss here. And at 30 degrees, there's a very definite uprange loss. Um, and that's what we're seeing. So when we look at craters like this, you happen to be scanning around the moon with your telescope, and you see something like this, you're going to say, wow, look, here is a forbidden zone. There's almost no ejecta. These initial ejecta rays over here do not appear to come from the center of the crater at all, but they're from way out over the side of the rim. The same is true over here with a nice forbidden zone. Uh, and then these initial uh, rays over to the side. And then the rest of it's going to be very symmetrical and radial. 
this was an oblique impact. This is the end zone, again, begins to start at around 30 degrees. Uh, some uh, other examples that are more common, this is Crater Thales, which is over near Mare Christian, which is down here. And you can see how these clearly come off uh, from the side of the crater itself. Uh, this is the classic propolis. This is Mare Christian, in fact. Uh, here is the crater, and you can see these rays really do come off from the side, and they have a nice, large, forbidden zone. Now, as the impact angle continues to drop, we've been talking about things that start around 30 degrees, as the impact angle continues to drop down to about 5 degrees, you're going to get a second kind of pattern emerging, and this is one, they call it a butterfly pattern. It is one where you have a forbidden zone uprange, as well as a loss of ejecta downrange. They call this a butterfly pattern. So, should you see something like this, we're talking about something that uh, is around 5 degrees with respect to normal. You can see these on other planets. This is one from Mars. This is a rampart crater as far as height. But you can see how the eject is really all at the sides. This would be an extremely low oblique angle. You also see some elongation with almost what looks like another crater here. We're going to come back to that in just a second. That may be due to uh, a shearing off of the top part of the crater. Um, I want you to just kind of hold that in your mind so that when, we, when I talk about it, you can kind of have that in your memory, because that's a really good example of it. The classic example of a butterfly ejecta crater on the moon is this one, which I won't ask you what it is because you would just read it to me. Uh, this is Messier and Messier A, and you can see the nice butterfly ejecta coming off of the sides. You can see it right here. It doesn't even appear to come off directly from the center of the crater. Uh, Messier has a companion, which is Messier A, which has another odd ejected pattern, which are just two streaks that go uh, out in this direction, and the mechanism for that's not well understood. Uh, here it is at higher uh, resolution and with a whole lot more contrast. You can actually see the angle uh, where the ejecta has come off. Now, we've been talking about how the ejecta itself shifts with the uh, angle of inclination of the impact. But that's not the only thing that changes in oblique impacts. You can also get an elongation of the crater itself, which some of you undoubtedly noted. Uh, studies were done where they shot uh, aluminum uh, target, aluminum uh, bolloids, uh, aluminum things, aluminum thingies, aluminum beads, <laughs> at uh, what uh, we would have to consider to be relatively low velocities, just over only about one uh, to two kilometers per second. It's very hard to produce something that's 20 kilometers per second. Uh, uh, and uh, they shot them at different angles. This is at uh, 7, 4, and 2. And you can see that once you get above, below about 10 degrees, you begin to get some elongation of the crater itself, which continues to extend. And this is exactly what we're going to find on the moon. Here is an SEA. We already know that's below 5 degrees because of the butterfly ejecta, right? Okay. And so it doesn't surprise us to see that it is also elongated. Uh, this was just talking about the, the secondary crater and the odd ejecta pattern off of it, which uh, again is very strange. And you just want to think about it for a second. Uh, you would ex uh, the possibilities for the second second one uh, are either that they were separate projectiles, one projectile hit an angle, later time another projectile hit more vertically, but that doesn't explain the bizarre ejecta of the second one. Uh, that was a binary projectile. You have a binary gravitationally bound striking. We think of the Chimiker Lady 9 as an example of, of that, but that was contrary to corruption. Uh, but if that were the case, then you would expect this not only to have a butterfly ejecta, but this to have a butterfly ejecta. Uh, you can have a decapitation event where, as the shock wave is moving back to the bulloid, which is impacting, if, uh, as it approaches the free surface, it begins to create tears in uh, the upper part of the uh, meteorite, uh, along with the general stress of impact, and that whole top part can just simply shear off, and they call it a decapitation event. Decapitation event. You can even ricochet where it strikes, skips, and strikes again. Uh, but most of the studies done with that show that the amount of energy dissipated is only along the order of like 5%. Uh, so it doesn't really explain why this ejected blanket is so different from this one. Uh, maybe the local geology has something to do. It's just a very bizarre, uh, bizarre objective blanket, but really very worthwhile looking for. And again, not that far from Mare Christian. Uh, there are a number of lookalikes for these oblong craters, which are due to oblique impacts. And let me just go through the scale once again. Above, below 30 degrees, you begin to get a forbidden zone, and the ejecta 
uh, at the entrance point appears to not be radial to the center of the crater itself. As you get below 10 degrees uh, with respect to the surface, the crater begins to elongate. As you get below 5 degrees, you begin to get this butterfly ejecta. Now, there's some lookalikes. Uh, secondary craters are certainly lookalikes. These are nice and elongated, but uh, they're actually much lower uh, in their velocities, impacts, and here are examples. These are all from uh, Copernicus. Uh, you can see how, yes, they are elongated. They have this, what's called a herringbone pattern, which is normally considered diagnostic for um, secondary cratering, and, and so it's not a true oblique impact. Uh, another lookalike is due to foreshortening. As we get closer and closer to the limb of the moon, everything looks oblong, right? They all look like, you know, they were uh, oblique impacts. Uh, and so this is in Dynan from the Consolid Consolidated Lunar Atlas, which is just a telescope, it's a Catalina telescope, looking up at the moon, taking pictures. If you correct for the foreshortening, though, we see that it's actually quite circular. This is in Dynan from the Rectified Lunar Atlas, where they took the images from the Consolidated Lunar Atlas, projected them up onto a white ball, and then took pictures of that white ball from the appropriate angle, and could correct for the foreshortening. Really, a very fun atlas to look for. Some other lookalikes are when you have a binary impact. This is for a celly. It looks like a binary impact because binary impacts tend to have a septum where the two meet, which is due to the interaction of the ejecta itself. Uh, it will create what looks like an elongated crater, but it's not actually due to a low angle impact. It's due to two impacts occurring together. You can have two impacts occurring at different times, but being locally related to each other. And so you can see this one is, is earlier, pardon me, this one's earlier, this one's later because the ejecta has spilled out into the larger one. Uh, so again, lookalikes that have to be watched for. From here, we're going to leave oblique impacts and move to simultaneous impacts. Are there any questions about oblique impacts? Just, just a question about the, about the, the, the time sequence of the, the various stages of the of the impact. Are we talking microseconds or minutes or years or what are we? Uh, in, uh, How much time uh, elapsed? How much time elapsed? In the formation of the crater? Yes. Look, <coughs> it's, back it's, to your uh, they're very, very short. Uh, I just read something that was uh, talking about basins and it said that a 200 kilometer uh, in diameter crater uh, is almost completely formed by 15 minutes. Uh, the shock wave moves at around uh, initially 10 kilometers per second. Uh, and so the the, uh, the, consummate, the consuming of the meteoroid itself is a fraction of a second, um, and the crater itself, something like Copernicus, is going to be formed in well under a minute. And they're just very fast, yes, very fast. Other questions? <coughs> yes. Is it known the different types of materials inside the meteorite? <coughs> cause different kinds of impacts? Matter of fact, they do. Uh, it's going to be due to things like density, right? Because now you've got more mass, and something with more mass at the same velocity is going to have more energy. Uh, but as far as, and so there are going to be some uh, changes in like the size of the crater, uh, but as far as the actual geology of the uh, crater types, the, the peaks, the terraces, the floor, that's not going to change. Those all function like a point transfer of energy. Other questions? Okay. Onward then. Simultaneous impacts. <coughs> the question is, is indeed what happens when two bolloids, two meteorites, strike uh, at the same time, especially if like the gravitation is down. Studies were done uh, to examine this. Uh, this is the important ratio. This is the uh, uh, in this study, two uh, <laughs> Bullets, two uh, uh, BBs were shot at a target at very low velocity. You see, this is only three quarters of a kilometer per second. The separation is 1% of the diameter of the um, BB. Okay, so very close together. Uh, when that's done, it just creates a circular crater. However, when you separate them by like three quarters of a diameter, a little further apart, then it begins to create double craters, both the interaction of the ejecta. So you get a shared wall, often they call this a D shape. It does look kind of like a D, doesn't it? Along with uh, the two ejecta blankets interacting, interfering, forming a line between the two. 
And we can see examples of this. This is Bessarian B, I can see I mislabeled this one, uh, over an Oceanus proslinare. Uh, and yes, it has that very distinct V shape. If uh, this crater has been eroded somewhat, you can't see the ejecta line, which would have extended out, but it most surely would have been there. And in the next example, we can see it. This is Oceanus proslinare. You can see this one. You can see this one. Uh, you can see this little line between, which is uh, not just some bright little mountain there, but it's actually the two ejected lines where they interacted with each other. Uh, here's a little example from Flavius where you can see this straight segment. There's that D again, uh, which means this may very well have been another binary impact. Binary impacts uh, don't have to be just, pardon me, simultaneous impacts don't have to be just binary. They can also be strings and chains. We talked about this already with like Comet Shoemaker and Levy 9, uh, where the comet got within the Roche limit of Jupiter, it fragmented, uh, say gravitationally bound together, and then impacted in Jupiter as a chain. Well, the same thing happens on the Moon. The Earth is probably with a disrupting force, uh, a, a disrupting force with a, like a cometary material, uh, but then that string can come around and it can impact indeed on the Moon. And there are several nice long chains on the Moon to be seen. This is Katina Day. Katina Davy, Katina Davy, which is uh, I think around 40 kilometers uh, in length, and you can see between them this nice ejecta, and you can see the deformation of the individual craters themselves due to interference with the ejecta patterns themselves. This is over not far from Alphonsus, uh, near the center of the moon, and it's very seeable if you're in our size telescopes. A much longer one, but more degraded, is the Albufida chain. That is this crater Albufida. You can see how this chain starts here. Look at this nice D shape here, and the deformation of these inner ones. This goes on for some 200 kilometers. Uh, and you can track that again. A really quite lovely moon, uh, quite lovely feature uh, near the center of the moon, not far from Marinette. Back uh, yes. Uh, there's some lookalikes, though. We've been talking about simultaneous impacts, binaries, or chains. There's some lookalikes. Anybody would ask if anybody knows what this is, but I can see uh, that's kind of, you know, I love audience participation, but not when the speaker is stupid. Uh, <laughs> this is Hygenus Frill. Uh, Hygenus Frill is a marvelous feature to see, and it looks like a nice crater chain, doesn't it? But in fact, it is not. Anybody know what this is? Anyone want to shot at it? Yes? Fracturing of the crust? I guess it is fracturing of the crust. That's what this is. This is a grave as far as height, where you have extension. Uh, if you extend the moon along a single fault, that single fault will give way. If you have it along parallel faults, extension, then as those parallel faults pull apart, the central just fall down. That's called a grave, and that's indeed what we have all along here. The most common reason for a grave is a grave is a dike of magma rising uh, from the mantle up into the crust. Uh, and causing this extensional force. Now, uh, these little pits, initially you might think that these are volcanic and per perhaps a place where magma poured out. But if it poured out, it would have covered up the grave, so we know that's not the case. Rather, what happened is they remained subsurface, they eroded away the subsurface supports, so that when the magma later dissipated, when it you know, flowed out somewhere else over in Mar Mari Imbrim, somewhere forming a nice uh, uh, nice magma layer somewhere. Uh, then, the, without the structural support, these became collapsed pits. They just fell down. You can see these in Hawaii also. Uh, so this is probably a series of volcanic collapsed pits. This is a lovely feature to see, uh, and again, it's really very worthwhile spending your time finding. Another uh, lookalike would be an endogenous chain like this. You may want to take a shot at what this is, since I didn't name it. Thank God. Mm -hmm. Anyone? It's kind of fun, isn't it? We have to look at it. Uh, this is most likely a lava tube, which has been unroofed due to meteorite erosion. Uh, and so as meteorites continue to impact, various parts of the roof simply gave way. Uh, and so you can see it tracking along here. This is a nice volcanic region over in the western edge of Oceanus Cross and You can see some very unusual craters, which represent magma intrusions. Okay, that's it for simultaneous impacts. Any questions on those? Thank you to the water for the Okay, the next type are dark halo craters. Craters on the moon shouldn't be dark halo. They are white. We all know that. We've all looked at the moon. We've all seen those nice, bright, white ejecta blankets which extend out for dozens of crater radii. Uh, but if you look carefully, you periodically see things that really just don't look white at all. 
Uh, there are a number of types of these. There are basically two, two types with some variants. One type is where you have simply a cinder cone. Uh, so it would be where you have a volcanic eruption on the moon. So these really aren't impact craters at all. Uh, as the uh, products of magma are erupted, if there's a lot of gas in them, and the gas on the moon would be carbon monoxide, it begins to come out of solution, it's called exhalation, it begins to come out, and it will act like a propellant. It will shoot, it will froth the magma, and it will shoot that magma high above the surface where it cools very quickly, becoming volcanic glass. Many of you remember that uh, the Apollo missions uh, found uh, orange glass and green glass, which were fire fountaining products on the moon, the volcanic glasses. Uh, so if, uh, if that's what occurs, then, this is a nice cinder cone, uh, we're going to come to it the next slide, then the eject, what looks like the eject around is actually the products of fire fountaining around that crater. Uh, another kind or variant is this one, which is a dark halo crater. This is in Alphonsus. Uh, if you look at Alphonsus in our size telescopes, you will see little dark spots here and there. And on a really good night, you can see various rills that connect the spots together. Those are rills are places where there's been extension due to a magma intrusion underneath uh, at various places, and that fractured the bottom of the, uh, the, the crater itself, forming these various rills. Ver at various places along uh, that rill, you have, at high magnification, you can see that there are these dark halo craters, likely where magma that had a lot of carbon monoxide in it gained access to the surface, was propelled up at high velocities, and high enough velocities that instead of falling back near the crater and forming a um, elevation in a rim, fell far enough away that it darkened the surface without creating a rim. So these are rimless dark halo craters. They're volcanic in nature also. You can actually see if you do the crater counting here, you see nice sharp craters and a bunch of them. When you do it here, you hardly see them. What you see are very dull craters and only a very few relatively sharp new ones. And that's because these volcanic glass beads simply fell in and covered them up. This, however, is a different kind of dark halo crater. Uh, this is an example of where uh, we had a bilayer on the moon. You have a layer on top, which is very bright, and then a layer underneath, which is volcanic in nature. If you strike that with a meteorite, the meteorite strikes it, and it's able to get through that initial layer, the top layer, which is very bright, say like the ejecta of Copernicus, and those dark yellow craters we looked at there, then it will begin to exhum the volcanic products underneath, which will form a dark halo around it. So these are true impact craters. They've impacted in a thin bilayer and been able to gain access to the darker mag magma underneath, uh, which has been exhumed, and it forms a relatively dark halo around each of those craters. This is a cinder cone from Hawaii. That's what they look like. Here's an ice cinder cone on the moon. Uh, here is uh, Alphonsus again. Uh, this was, uh, which, which uh, spacecraft was this from? Anyone? <laughs> it's a Ranger? Ranger 9. Ranger, I love Ranger. Anybody have seen it? You've seen it, I'm sure many of you have seen it with Ranger. They all had these little things that usually pretty easy to call. Uh, the Ranger series was, it had to be dreamed of by some guy because, you know, you know, guys say, well, let's crash things, you know, and let's see what happens, you know, like, you know, they you know, buffeted uh, the moon with the Prospector mission from Alan Binder. Let's, let's hit the moon with it and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. That's definitely a guy thing to do. Uh, well, they hit it with Ranger 2. These were all crashers. The next series was a surveyor, which were soft landers. The crashers, as they went down, they took pictures all the way. And some of the last pictures are extremely high resolution. Uh, res resolution we've not been able to reproduce. This isn't anywhere clear to the final resolution. It gets much finer than that. But even here, uh, you know, this is what it, almost what it looks like in our telescopes. You see, that especially like this little rill, uh, these are the dark halo craters around it, which are all volcanic uh, fire fountain products. Uh, here's a much higher, uh, much later image from the Ranger, where you have the rill as well as this dark halo crater and the softening material. Now, dark halo craters. Well, before we go back to dark halo craters that are volcanic in nature, let's take a quick look at some dark halo craters that are due to impact into a bilayer. Uh, we've already talked about Copernicus. Here's the one in Copernicus. And the impact of that bright bilayer, and the bright part was the objective from the Copernicus impact itself. Uh, this is Theophilus, these three, though. 
uh, in Theophilus, which is still relatively recent. So it's at the relatively recent. Uh, the where impacts occurred in its ejecta, they also exhumed uh, volcanic material underneath, and that's forming these dark halo craters. Again, these are seeable in three-inch size telescopes. If you're paying attention. Uh, I had the. Yes, I don't. That ends dark halo craters. Uh, what kind of questions do you have about that? <clears throat> what kind of um, what kind of hints do you follow to figure out whether it's a volcanic, pre volcanic um, crater or, or an impact crater in the building? Two things. One, placement. Okay. And two is uh, looking at the geologic history of the area. Of the area. Uh, no, no. That's placement. Geologic history area is one. Okay, obviously, if you have an impact into um, uh, a bilayer right uh, at the Copernicus uh, ejected blanket or the Theophilus ejected blanket, that really raises your suspicion. Uh, in our size telescopes, you're not going to be able to get to the second area, which is the uh, actual shapes of the wall. And there are going to be some real differences in the shapes, like of a cinder cone with a, uh, um, a, a they call it a sun pit. Uh, uh, and an impact. Uh, the summit pits are uh, often non-circular. They are much less in volume than uh, the, the crater with, uh, with its rim, things of that nature. Uh, but most of these are fairly small, and in our size telescopes, you're not going to be able to tell. So you need to go to something else like lunar orbiter series or uh, some of these other more recent craft. Other questions? Yes. Why would the very large impacts not go straight to like the mantle and release that um, magma? Yes, well, that is a good question. Uh, it's interesting that uh, in the history, in the geologic history, the history of the geology of the magma, uh, it took them a long time to recognize that the basins, which are the, have all the magma fill, were actually impact structures. And then there was the thought, well, they're all impact structures, so maybe you have decompressive uh, volcanism. If you suddenly remove the confining pressure, uh, you will uh, increase the temperature underneath. Uh, and if it's close to melting point, they will become a, kind of like a flash magma. But that's thought not to actually happen on the moon. It's just not up to be enough temperature <laughs> shifting. Uh, so most of the uh, magma on the moon in the basins is because when you uh, strip away most of the crust, you have isostatic compensation where the mantle begins to move up, so the magma is closer, and you also have deep fractures and faults underneath the basin itself, which would form basically zones of weakness for the magma to track up. And so that's why they tend to occur with, with the uh, basins. Is that the question you were asking? No, I was asking why did the larger craters just immediately like, send out the most of them don't get down to actually the mantle itself. So <coughs> it's too deep. Other thoughts? One more thing. Concentric ring craters. These are fun. We'll come back, by the way, to some dark halo craters because uh, there are some later on that uh, are fun to look at. Uh, concentric ring craters are things like this. This is Crater Hasadis. Uh, it is a concentric ring crater. You have a, a little ring inside. It's like, my God, how could that form? Uh, and uh, you begin to wonder. Uh, the mechanisms of formation are thought to be twofold. The older one, and which is one I still like, is impact into a bilayer. Uh, what was thought to happen, where you had an unconsolidated surface layer and then a consolidated layer underneath. When an impact occurs in that form, it will very easily excavate the unconsolidated layer, like the regolith, right? which on the Lunar Highlands is roughly 15 meters in depth. Uh, fairly easy to exhume. But once that shockwave begins to hit the consolidated layer, it has more difficulty excavating it. And so initially, uh, if you just excavate the regolith, nice bowl-shaped crater. Get a little bit further along your, your shock wave, that shock wave will scour the material off of the more consolidated layer, but not be able to break it up or pierce it so you have a flat floor. Get a little further along, and the ejecta begins to interact, forming a little bump on the surface. And that's, uh, those, these are the stages uh, that are thought to occur. 
Uh, and then finally, uh, if it's a little larger impact, a little more energy, and then that shock wave directly underneath, which means it hasn't had to go further, so it's not dissipated as much, directly underneath is going to be able to excavate the consolidated layer. But off to the side, more tangential, that shock wave has had to travel through more material, it has dissipated some, and it may not be able to, and that will form a shelf, which is the shelf of the inner ring. Uh, this is an example which may show that, I'm not sure. If you have a nice bowl-shaped crater, if you have a crater with a scoured floor, if you have a crater with a little bump, now this is not a central peak due to rebound, this is way too small. Uh, those don't occur in Asia, uh, as we said earlier, around 15, 20 kilometers. This is much smaller than that. Uh, and the next stage up would then be something like a concentric ring crater. Uh, here's some examples of concentric ring craters, which we can't see, unfortunately. These are from these two, Repsol and Repsol, uh, which are way over on the western limb of the, of the moon. You can see the, the edges, but we really can't see inside them much, which is too bad because these are just marvelous. Look at these nice concentric ring craters inside. Um, there is a second mechanism which some people have posed of light, uh, which has some real validity. Uh, and it's based on odd concentric ring craters like this. This does not look like an excavation event, does it? This looks much more like a volcanic intrusion. And so what these uh, authors have suggested and, uh, a couple years ago uh, was that maybe these are actually volcanic intrusions that occur inside a crater. Uh, and indeed, most concentric ring craters are found on the edges of basins. Uh, so there's some validity to that. And some of these, they really look like volcanic inflation. Uh, now, why the volcanic intrusion would only occur over at the side, now that's a little bit baffling, so I'm not really sure we know what's going on here. But these are really intriguing features. Uh, here's another nice little concentric ring crater. This is Crater Mar. Uh, you can see we are here at uh, um, uh, Mare Humorum. Uh, this is the uh, I can't think of what this formation is called. Anybody help me there? Yeah, the Arcua Rills uh, that form right along the side of it. I'm just trying to locate it for you. Uh, and here we have this nice little concentric ring crater. And here it is uh, on the northern view. And if you look at that northern view and really juice up the contrast, what you see is it's actually on a slight rise. It has a ring around it. So this, this bears maybe something to that notion that these aren't deep volcanic intrusions. This one is appearing to occur directly on the place where volcanic inflation has occurred in the crust. Okay, there's some lookalikes for concentric ring craters, which we shouldn't be confused with. You can indeed have a crater occurring inside a crater, and you can see this one, I chose this example because these are clearly from different time periods. This one's been deeply eroded. This one's really relatively fresh. Another lookalike is a mega slump, uh, where you have uh, the side wall terracing, a huge section of it giving away, and it almost looks like a second ring inside, but it doesn't. Here's a wonderful example of a mega slump. This is crater Janssen over in the Janssen Formation near uh, Marinette Cars. Uh, it is a wonderful example of, of one to see. Also, some nice grills in it and such. Uh, okay, any questions about concentric ring craters? Yeah. Fun to look for. Yes. What's causing the erosion you're talking about? Uh, the moon doesn't have too much in the way of erosive force. The primary one is micrometeorite erosion. So across time, now you will erode away a crater's parts, and they will occur in a sequence, so it doesn't occur randomly. Uh, so, for example, in a 100-kilometer crater, the first thing to go is the bright ejecta blanket, followed by the secondary uh, impact pattern, followed by the discontinuous ejecta, followed by the continuous ejecta, and uh, the rim at that point will also become dull and will finally then, in what's called the pre-nectarium period, which is 4.2 billion years before, will simply become uh, a dull, featureless bowl. Is that exact enough that you can use that to determine aging? It is indeed. Now there's some problems with it. One, you have to, larger craters erode much slower than smaller craters, so they need to be in the same size. Uh, you need to be in a place where you aren't going to have had other <coughs> kinds of forces acting on it, like mechanic forces covering up the secondary ejecta or something like that. Uh, in feet, and in fact, volcanism has covered up a lot of features. Many of, I was just talking to somebody earlier about the Imbrian Basin, which has multiple rings. Most of them were simply covered up by the magma, so we only see the outer one. Uh, and the peaks like Mons Piton, etc., those are just places 
the very top part of some of those inner rings that didn't get covered up. Uh, as well as you can have some discontinuous erosion due to uh, uh, ejected from nearby impacts that were large. But given some of those limitations, absolutely, you can. Okay. That question over there. Yeah. Do we have any idea then how many old craters took another hit exactly in the center? Yeah, no, no idea. Uh, Are there some uh, of those? Yes, there have to there have to be, sure. Uh, and that's because, especially on the, what we call the islands, uh, I only say that because they're now not calling them islands anymore, now they're calling them something else. Uh, they call them uh, uh, Kelspatrick Island terrain. Uh, but let's ignore that. That's a geo geochemical uh, classification. Um, uh, on most of the highland areas, there's been saturation of the impacts. Uh, and saturation uh, occurs when uh, there have been so many impacts that each new impact doesn't cause any increase in the number of craters visible. It's a jack covers up the same number that it creates. Uh, and so many of the old ones are simply been erased away due to impact erosion. Yes? This may be a dumb question, but uh, what, is, what, is, what is the frequency of new impacts on the moon? Of impacts? Of impacts, right. Well, that's a good, that's, that's a good question. And especially when you know, we've had a number of uh, people that have been doing video astronomy and they record these little bright flashes. When Apollo left his LSET packages, one of the packages was a seismometer. And, they made, and, and using that, they were able to measure moon flights. But they also reported impact shock waves. Uh, and by uh, looking at the data, what they estimated was roughly once a year there's an impact of a meteorite between one and five metric tons. Now, that's still tiny. That's only going to form a crater you know, 20 meters across, maybe, at most, 40 meters across at most, with its ejecta. And so there's still way below, well below the resolution of any of the Earth-based telescopes. Uh, but you will see the bright flash. So over time, the map has to be continually be updated. Matter of fact. The mapping on the, on the moon has to be updated then, right? Yeah. So here in like 100 million years, absolutely, there will be some. <laughs> 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 Uh, they estimate that, uh, I've seen the numbers, it's hard to keep in your head, but an impact along the lines of meteor crater, which is 1.1 kilometers across, that's really quite small on the moon, uh, occurs on Earth once every, uh, what was it? You know, I had the figure in my head and I lost it. Then. Uh, I can't think. One the size of uh, one that ended the dinosaur period, which is the Chickasaw impact, which created a crater that was 200 kilometers across, occurs once every 60 million years. Mm -hmm. to be. Uh, so I actually do for once. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not a problem at all. Uh, but, and so it, 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 in the early solar system, uh, when we were sweeping up you know, all of the junk in the garbage, there was just a lot of it around. Uh, lots and lots of impacts. Oh, you have such a heavy impact record. Uh, but the, if you look at the um, estimate based on crater counts and dating and radioactive dating and things like that, it's an exponential function. We're, we're way over in the tail. Now, it certainly is possible for something to happen, uh, something which shifts, like the asteroid belt. Uh, they think that's they the cause of what someone called the late heavy bombardment, which was a burst of a meteorite, thought to be a burst of, it's never been proven, and a lot of it's just thought to be a burst of meteorite impacts around the inverted period. Yes? Um, so on, on the Earth, uh, a number of years ago, they did a study found that uh, large meteorite impacts on the Earth resulted in uh, the shockwave going through the Earth and doing a fracture of the surface on the opposite end, mm -hmm. causing mm -hmm. mountain ranges and volcanism and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Is there any evidence of that on the Moon opposite? Yes. Correct. Yeah. yeah. The antipode is a place to look for a jumbled terrain, and it does occur. Uh, in fact. There's something, a uh, funny phenomenon called shock remnant magnetism, which is where as the shock wave goes through the moon and, and the magnetic uh, field lines are collected due to the ionized plasma of the uh, eject itself, uh, that where at the antipode, uh, there can be enough energy to shock into the place where uh, the uh, magnetic signature is retained. It goes above what's called the Curie point. Uh, and then drops below and it re retains that mag magnetic signature. And it's thought that's what things like gamma rain represent, mm -hmm. that bright swirl feature. Yes? 
When, uh, when did they think the last time a magma, magma event actually occurred? Over here? La uh, it's debated. The, the, the most recent magma that they found, based on crater counting, which is not radioactive data, is thought to be in what's called the Arachisthenian period, uh, and is thought to be roughly 1.2 billion years of age. The vast majority of magma occurred in the Imbrian period, you know, around 3.8 to 3.85 billion years ago. Other questions? <clears throat> Excellent. Okay. Floor fracture craters now. Floor fracture craters we've already kind of been through. This is our old old friend. There's rep salt. You can see this deeply fractured uh, 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 crater with these wonderful uh, concentric ring craters inside. Uh, how do floor fractures occur? Uh, most floor fractured craters occur are at the edges of basins. And so there's a genetic relationship, apparently, between the basins and the magma, which fill them, and the craters themselves. Uh, it's often what happened where uh, after the uh, basin event, you had these deep fractures that went through, the magma as partial melts began to form later on, began to track up these faults because they were weak. As they got close to the basin, they didn't know which fault was from a basin and which was from a crater next to the basin. And so some of them tracked up faults into craters that were near the basins and began to collect under that floor. When we talked about being a semi-consolidated semi floor, they began to collect in a pocket underneath it. And if you collect enough, it will eventually start to up bow and even cause surface failure, which is a fracture then in the crust. Uh, and that's what these are all thought to represent. These are just failures of the crust, uh, uh, that semi-consolidated lens of material, uh, which sits uh, at the bottom of the crater itself. The most famous one, and the one we always see, is the Pavius. Uh, this is the way we usually see it. This is one nice long one. It actually get up into the uh, uh, lunar orbiter, and you can see there are many little fractures around it. Now, one of the really interesting things here, especially if we think about these being due to volcanic intrusion underneath, and the odd thing about it is, if you notice this always seems a little dark. I had noticed that, but I had no clue what it was. I figured just some, you know, you know, some kid went up there with a crayon or something. <laughs> and uh, and here they are now on the lunar orbiter, and not only are they dark, but they're smooth. What does that look like to you? Anyone? Yeah, it does. Kind of reminds you of the dark halo crater we talked about earlier, where you have uh, some of it gaining access to the surface in a place where there are <coughs> fractures. Uh, and uh, the carbon monoxide gas propelling it out, uh, forming volcanic glasses, which fall back around and create these little dark halo areas. And that appears to be what these are. Here it is in my charm application. You can certainly more clearly see them. And also see these wonderful faults, uh, fractures running through the Tavius itself. Another classic is Atlas over here. And this is what we normally see at higher power. Uh, this is from the SMART mission. Uh, and you can see there's a whole lot of little fractures in here. You can also see this kind of a dark area here, and a dark area here. Which you really can't see in our scopes very well. I guess you kind of can there a little bit. And Gaddis uh, went ahead and looked at these and found that, yes, indeed, these are dark halo craters also, a place where uh, you have magma uh, gaining access to the surface as a, as a fire counting event. Uh, finally, you can have craters with volcanic components. We already talked about these with concentric rings. This one really looks, again, volcanic in nature. This is over at Oceanus Cross Lerner. Uh, but these ones, they just look like volcanic intrusions inside that happen to be inside the crater. Okay. Any questions about floor fractured craters? Hopefully you enjoy us looking for some of these things. I mean, you're just puttering around on the moon with your telescope, and all of a sudden you see something. And if you're paying attention, if you're really looking, being careful what you're looking at, you say, that doesn't look right. And I'll be honest, that happens to me all the time. I love looking through the old uh, lunar orbiter images or the Ranger image and, uh, mission images. And, you know, I'm just always seeing something that doesn't look right. And then you have to sit around and think about you know, what kind of classification does it fall into, what's going on in geology around it, what's the geologic history of the region, and begin to start to put together something. Really, I find quite fun. Non-circular craters. You know how to think of craters as circular. I mean, if the target was uniform, they should be circular, right? And the shock wave propagates in a circular fashion. However, even in our most famous crater, Earth, Berenger Crater, uh, it is not. It has these big straight segments. It almost looks like a square with rounded edges, doesn't it? What appears to have happened 
is that there were already faults in this section of the Earth and faults in this section of the Moon we're going to look at. Now that shock wave is going to preferentially, preferentially excavate along those faults because they're zones of weakness and allow for reflection. Further, in the modification phase, when the stuff in the side wall starts falling in, where is it especially going to fall in? Well, along those fractures, right? They're already present. Those will tend to elongate. And that's what creates these nice, long, straight sections. Uh, on the moon, I mean, look at these. Uh, here's this is funny section. Certainly isn't a very circular crater at all. That again, probably be a place where there are uh, various faults, uh, which uh, uh, are tracked along by the shock wave. Uh, and creating these nice, uh, odd, oddly shaped craters. Uh, or this one, this is Goclenius, one of the most wonderful in the series of rills over in, uh, this is, these are arcuate rills, over in Mara Pinatopis. Uh, and again, here we have these nice, long, funny, straight, almost polygonal structures. Uh, this is Crater W. Bond, which looks like kind of a square over there near Mari Fregoris. Okay, that ends are really a survey of some of the more bizarre craters that are really worth spending our time looking for on the moon. I went ahead and collected just a few from Mars also to show that they can be even different yet. Uh, indeed, uh, here's one on Mars uh, where uh, most likely we have water flowing in this direction. The crater armored that section uh, so that the water flowed around it, creating a teardrop shaped island. This is a pedestal crater, likely the deflation of the surrounding area by uh, wind forces. Uh, this is a rampart crater, also called a Yuta crater, uh, where instead of ballistic sedimentation, uh, a dry sediment uh, moving along uh, the surface, it appears to be a wet <coughs> sediment moving along, almost as if it were a muddy slurry. Uh, and in, 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 uh, in placing it's a series almost of lobes. Here you can actually see where it went around the lobes. Uh, here's another funny one on Mars. Top of the place where there was a little less water, and so you have kind of a mixture. Uh, and then here's a place where you have a little pound of set in the center, likely due to a blow off from uh, water vapor as it, as it uh, reached, the, uh, reached the surface. So uh, lots of oddness. And there's some more oddness yet. You go on, on to uh, some of the other plants like listening to get Bahamas. <coughs> which is a basin with something like 40-some rings uh, sitting around it. So just lots of oddness and fun in planetary geology to play with. Thank you. All right, we have time for a few questions, so. The spaceship that crashed into the moon? Yes. Did they leave a crater? Yes, they had to. And there's uh, some of them you can actually see. Um, the, one of these uh, missions, I can't remember which one, uh, was actually able to. Uh, uh, I know I've, I've seen it, but I can't remember which mission it was. But yes, it will all leave a crater. They're small, they don't have much velocity, and they don't have much mass. Either one. Uh, the mass, the velocity is. Uh, things coming into them, a lot of due to the approach velocity from you know various things out in space, which all have uh, a relative velocity compared to the uh, target that they're that they're going to strike. Uh, short period comets, long period comets have much higher, like the short period comets, uh, as far as uh, their uh, approach velocity. Uh, the actual velocity that a meteorite strikes at is the approach velocity plus the escape velocity. Uh, on a airless body. So on the moon, the escape velocity is 2.4 kilometers per second, which means anything, no matter if it's the smallest piece of the dust, it gets caught in that moon's gravitational field, it will have a minimum velocity of 2.4 kilometers per second. On Earth, we slow them down because our atmosphere, we didn't have that. <coughs> Everything would strike at 11 kilometers per second at a minimum. But as it is, most things have an approach velocity also, and that's why you get up into the 20 and 40 kilometers per second. We just simply can't match that with our spacecraft, so they have much, much less energy. But they have to be some sort of crater. Yes? I just thought everybody who's young here ought to know that they broadcast those things live in the middle of the night. And uh, in 1964, I stayed up and watched them crash into the moon. It was phenomenal. Watch which one? Those rangers that crashed really? into the moon. Oh, that's wonderful. They sent them back. Yeah, picture at a time. Yes, yeah, I have the images, but they didn't have the flash of the crash itself. No, well, you, it was 
just went blank. Yes. And in fact, the last uh, images are often like, you know, a third of an image and the rest of it's just static. Uh, it really is uh, it's quite fun. But boy, the resolution. I mean, you see things are just unimaginable. Uh, it's exciting. Getting down to those were very heavy Yes? Even though you can't observe it directly, have you studied images of the dark side and are there anything on the dark side that uh, you might not see on the near side? Unfortunately not. We really wish there were. Uh, most of the dark side looks like our high ones. Uh, very little volcanism at all on the, dark, on the back side. And it's thought to be for a couple of reasons. One is the crust is thicker, so it has further to go. And the other thing, which has been more recent, is that most of the Radioactive materials are in a layer that they call the creep layer, stands for potassium, rare earth, elements, and phosphorus. Uh, and the creep layer, for some reason, is located underneath and around the proximal and basin on the near side. Uh, and so you just simply, that's where the vast majority of the volcanism is going to occur, is the radioactive potassium, uranium, thorium, decay, and create the partial melt. It doesn't appear to be that layer on the, on the far side. Uh, there's a little bit of volcanism in the in some of the big basins, like the South Palatine Basin, uh, a little bit in uh, Orientali Basin, but it's just not much. Most of it just looks like the islands. Yes? Question. Uh, what's the best uh, moon phase to observe these features? Surely not the uh, full moon when you're looking straight on, uh, but the light is straight on. What's, what's the best uh, lighting? It depends on what you want to do. Now, if you're looking at the objective blankets, the higher the illumination, yeah, the better. There you can see these forbidden zones really nicely. Uh, but almost anything else, you want to be near the Terminator. Uh, and, it, and so it doesn't matter which phase outside of full or new, you just want to be near the Terminator because that's where the shadow gives you the details so you can locate the geology. So any time other than full moon. Yes. There are some wonderful sections on the moon that you just love. Like Rima Hippolis. Oh, that was the argument reel I couldn't remember. Rima Hippolis. Uh, it's just a marvelous feature. And, and you know, there are faults and fractures and cracks and gravens in the moon in that section, or the Trisnecker region, highly volcanic region, uh, with uh, all kinds of things like Rima Hygienis is over in the Trisnecker region. Uh, and those are just wonderful to sit and play with and just look at and wonder. And there's some, again, some dark halo. Uh, when you have the volcanism uh, fire founding occurring in a crater, they call it dark halo crater. When it occurs but doesn't appear to be located in a crater, they call it dark mantling. It will be more irregular and usually larger in area. Uh, and use some of those, there are some of those kind of dark patches that call the dark mantling regions in the Tristanecker region also. Just wonderful to look at. Uh, but the real point is you have to be near the Terminator. Yes? Uh, it seems like all the craters have an age associated with it. How is that done? Uh, Originally, what they did was the, and this was developed by Don Wilhelms, what was called stratigraphic technique, uh, which is where you examine the lunar features in relation to the features around what they covered up or what was covered up by other things. And so you can construct a relative chronology. And by using that, you could show that more recent craters had like a bright ejecta blanket. But if you get back very far, the bright ejecta blanket is lost. Um, uh, and you go back a little bit further and other parts are lost. And these came to be associated with certain ages, but they didn't have dating for it. So if it had its ejective blanket, they said it was in the Copernican period. If it lost its ejective blanket, its bright ejective pattern, but it retained all the other parts, discontinuous, continuous, uh, central peak, the terracing, the secondary craters, then it was said to be in the Eratosthenian period. But again, they didn't have ages for them. After the Apollo missions went up, they began to radio date the uh, various rocks. And now they had some ages they could begin to pin them to. And so now the Copernican period is from present to 1.2 billion years of age. The Rathasthenian period is 1.2 to 3.2 billion years of age. Your embryo is 3.2 to 3.85 billion years of age, and et cetera. Uh, so that was how the dating was originally done. Uh, and then you went, as they had those, they could sit around and talk about medium-sized craters, say ones that are 40 to 60 kilometers, uh, and could say, you know, if you had this, then we know roughly what age you are in, uh, given that uh, uh, the rates of degradation based on crater size itself. Does that help? Yeah. Good. Uh, yes? The, the one that you showed on Earth, I forget what it was called just a few minutes ago, how deep is that one? 
Berenger. Berenger, yeah. Berenger? Uh, I don't have it. No. Uh, there. I think it's about a mile or something like that. Oh, mm -hmm. Couldn't be. It's a mile. It's a mile across. 1.2 kilometers across. So 600, 600 feet. Is it 600? Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, how the moon is formed as a plant or maybe a proto plant the size of Mars hit the Earth. Is that pretty much accepted? That's as still possible at this point. There's some things people don't like about it, but it's still, and there's still some problems with it. But yeah, it's the only theory that has held up by the scrutiny so far. All the other ones had problems. You know, fission theory, you couldn't dissipate the uh, angular momentum. And, uh, the, uh, the capture theory couldn't account for the oxygen isotopes uh, and the oh, okay. amount of binding the materials energy and stuff like that. So the materials it's made out of. I'm sorry. The material it's made out of. Mean, or? Yeah, well, various things. Like uh, if it was the fission theory, which was that the Earth was spinning so fast that part of it spun oh. off, uh, we can't. Uh, it would require a much higher rotational energy on Earth right now uh, because rotational energy is very difficult to dissipate on uh, much limited friction. We're just rotating too slow, so the fission theory really kind of, kind of didn't work out very well. Uh, each of these various other theories began to fall by the wayside, so that in the 1960s, people used to say, we have a moon, we have no idea why. Uh, it shouldn't be there. Uh, it wasn't just like a dust cloud around that got accreted together like that or something like that. Well, that is how it occurred after the... Well, after, 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 that. after that, okay, but not to begin with after it got hit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, now the, the only theory we really have less standing, which explains most of the facts, but explains both the facts, is indeed the giant impact theory, or the giant black theory, or whatever you want to call it. So, and, and how that struck it? the Earth tangentially, uh -huh. threw a huge amount of material out in orbit. Uh -huh. uh, within a very short period of time, days, the metallic core uh, accelerated and came back to Earth. Uh, that helps account for why the moon is so metal poor. Uh, the rest of the material uh, formed a ring around Earth, but the ring was fairly transient and quickly coalesced into uh, the moon with uh, you know, impacting the gravitational centers. That created a magma ocean that was you know, uh, hundreds uh, to thousand plus kilometers deep and it's still cool. And how old is the moon? Uh, 4.2 billion years of age, thought to me. Or zero is the 4.5. So that's not much younger than that. No, in fact it isn't. It's just we eroded everything away. And moon yes, didn't get, get the hit. The only thing that really happened on the moon, we had impact erosion, but they also had magma, which covered it up. You know, a lot of the old stuff where the magma obviously occurred. Resurfaced, the resurfacing of that. Uh, and uh, most of the magma since it occurred at roughly 3.8 billion years of age, let's say, as an example, uh, that that surface only records things for the last 3.8 billion years, and you don't see too much in the way of larger impacts on it. So again, you can begin to construct a geologic history. Uh, other Yes? Are there any, like, comet impacts? Because I know the most recent Impact on the Earth is a comet. It comes to the crater. Yeah, it's not a crater, but yes, the event. Yeah, but wouldn't there be any like, ice residue left over from um, comets hitting? Matter of fact, there would. Undoubtedly, comets hit the moon. Uh, the ice was immediately vaporized. Some of it was ejected into the moon. Some of it reached escape velocity and was lost. But some of it. Uh, did go ahead and continue to uh, float uh, around the surface uh, and accumulated cold traps. Other parts of it underwent uh, probably sputtering light processes were you know, initially accumulated into a mineral and was struck by uh, something and it, you know, continued to, uh, to jump along until it finally reached cold traps. And that's part of the ices that are found in those cold traps throughout the various plants. Uh, yes, absolutely. We've got ancient, ancient water from those. Other questions? Yes. Um, <coughs> I used to do snow volcanism on the moon. You used to do what? It's not volcanism anymore. I'm sorry. Volcanism? Oh, volcanism, yes. Right. Um, but is there any. Um, 
what's the current perception about it? Is there, is there magma underneath the, the, the surface, or is it all solid plastic now? That's a fair question. Uh, most of the, matter, the general thing is that most of it is the slow fire. However, and, and so we haven't seen any magma eruptions the last 1.2 billion years. <coughs> I mean, there is going to be eventual exhaustion of those radioactive source creation and partial melts. Uh, however, radioactive gases have been detected in the, uh, the uh, Apollo mission detected radon gas uh, on the surface of the moon, which means that there's still something going on. So these gases periodically escaping. Some people say, well, those may be the causes of those TLP transit inner events that people talk about, where there's kind of an orange glow, everything is a little bit fuzzy under there. <coughs> Maybe it will be. That would make sense. Is there an associated uh, magnetic field? With the TLPs? Yeah. No, that anybody has ever measured. Uh, no, not that I know of. That would be interesting. The tr problem is they're so short lived and they're relatively uncommon and uh, relatively difficult to document all three. But yeah, that, uh, that would be fun to do if you, uh, if you actually had one. Or to shoot a, you know, a spectrographic image through <coughs> and uh, see what kind of uh, stuff's in it. Other question? Yes. Has the LRO actually seen one of the uh, transient phenomena yet? I'm sorry, has the one? The LRO actually seen one of the transient phenomena? Not that I know of. But I admit I've not been keeping up with the LRO. Maybe that's another question earlier about it. Right? Good. 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 Other questions? All right, well, we want to thank you very much for. Uh,